Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, July 28th, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here is a look at what's coming up tonight. Tonight, big banks reportedly have a new scheme. Then, Obama tells Snowden to come home and face the music. And Planned Parenthood goes into damage control to combat the most damning expose yet. And they don't even let you know in the interview what you're doing. Sun Express is a company that hires procurement techs to draw blood and dissect dead fetuses and sell the parts to researchers. They partner with Planned Parenthood and they get part of the money. I don't know what's going on, folks, but I can't handle it anymore. These people literally crawl out from under rocks. They run and hide in trash cans right in front of you. Why are we ruled by a bunch of trash can well, a third undercover Planned Parenthood video has been released today, and this time a whistleblower within the video reveals that it is basically just a huge fetal organ trafficking business. Now, this video was once again released by the Center for Medical Progress, and as expected, it sh shows footage of fetal body parts after abortion. So, warning, you're going to see some very disturbing video uh, of aborted fetuses in the coming up video. Now, this features whistleblower Holly O'Donnell, and she claims that a biomedical company that she was working for uh, was in the business of paying Planned Parenthood uh, clinics for these fetal organs. They basically partnered up with the clinics, and according to the condition of the tissue after it was extracted from the abortion, they would be paid based on the condition of the specimen. Um, O'Donnell says that the more valuable the tissue, the more money you would get. So if you can somehow procure a brain or a heart, you're going to get more money than just umbilical cord. So these claims, if they're true, are going to completely blow out the water of Planned Parenthood's repeated denial that they do not profit from the sale of this fetal tissue. Uh, O'Donnell goes on to say that we were asked to procure certain tissues like brain, liver, sinus, pancreas, heart, lungs, and pretty much anything on the fetus. It's basically a huge trafficking of fetal tissues. So go ahead and take a look at this video where O'Donnell talks about her first day on the job. So I remember my first day, I was at the Concord Clinic and it was very early in the morning. I was with one of my trainers and I, I walk in, I meet the staff and I look over in the corner and there's a, a little it's a little light tray with pie dishes on it. I'm like, hmm, okay. And then I see someone come in with a, a bottle of something and there was blood in it. I'm like, okay. And then they, they went over to the sink and they emptied it out in a strainer and put it on the pie dish and lit it up. And, and I'm like looking like what's going on. And my trainer comes over and she, she puts on gloves and she grabs some some tweezers and she's picking the parts away from the, the vaginal tissue and i'm i've never had anxiety before this at all so i'm looking and i don't know what's going on i had no idea this was what was going to be happening especially my first day and uh, she's literally she has tweezers and she's like okay well this is a head this is the arm this is a leg and she goes she hands them over so, oh here you go can you show me some of the parts i just showed you and i grabbed the tweezers i'm like because i didn't want to lose this job i didn't know um i was already stoked to get it so i just i did what she said in the moment i took the tweezers i i put them in the dish and i remember grabbing a leg and i said this is a leg and the moment I picked it up, I could just feel like death and pain. Like I've never felt that before, like shoot up through my body. And I started to, bl I blacked out basically. So it's amazing how in just an 11 week old fetus, they can identify the brain, the heart, the liver, lungs, even the sinus. And yet people still want to just call this a mass of cells. Now, Planned Parenthood, they preemptively notified Congress that more of these videos would be rolling out. They said that they would probably have some videos showing uh, footage of the clinics harvesting these fetal organs. And so they kind of bypassed the whole question of the legality 
of selling these organs and instead accused the Center for Medical Progress of breaking the law. Uh, they went so far as to call them the extremists and murderers. So total irony there, but uh, basically they really want Congress to get on this because they want to hang on to that more than $700,000 that each facility receives every single year from taxpayers. So uh, Breitbart reports it's about $714,285 tax dollars per clinic per year. So not only are they getting money for performing these abortions, but they're also getting money for selling baby parts and they're getting more than half a million dollars per clinic from taxpayers. So now Rand Paul and other Republicans are speaking out about this and they're pushing for investigations into Planned Parenthood's procedures and they're really pushing to defund this nonprofit organization. Paul says that the GOP can defund Planned Parenthood before the recess. Um, Paul says the problem here really is not just whether it's illegal to buy and sell the organs, but whether the taxpayer dollars should be going to a group that is sort of manipulating and turning the baby around to get access to organs. I think most people were horrified by these videos, like as you've seen on uh, previous videos that were released, the, they, the directors talk about altering the procedure that these women are going to be going through in order to uh, m make the more tissue more viable to sell. Uh, Paul goes on to say, I think that there should not be any financial incentives to get an abortion. Now they would argue that it just covers the cost, but anytime money changes hands, even if it's to a nonprofit group, that is a real question. We probably shouldn't be doing research on these babies because you would hate to think that there's any kind of incentive for that to occur. Incentive for getting abortions, but that's exactly what's happening. Now, former Planned Parenthood worker and current pro-life advocate Abby Johnson was on the Alex Jones Show today. She spoke with David Knight to discuss her experience at Planned Parenthood and just what caused her to leave that organization. So there were a couple of things that happened. One was that they imposed an abortion clinic quota hmm. on all of the facilities that performed abortion. So they told us you have to perform, you know, this many abortions every every day, every month, uh, in order to meet your goals, to receive your bonuses, to keep your staff. Uh, That's very troubling. Because if you had somebody that was just a doctor, let's say that this, this was a doctor that did heart surgery, and they came into that doctor and they said, you need to do X number of open heart surgeries right. or else. I mean, you would expect that perhaps they're going to be doing open heart surgeries that are not necessary because it's profit driven. Right. And abortion, and, and I can, you know, only really speak to my experience at Planned Parenthood, but it was very profit driven. So we were told at Planned Parenthood that we were to turn every client visit and every telephone call into a revenue generating visit. The only way that you can make money off of a pregnant woman at Planned Parenthood is to sell her an abortion because they don't provide prenatal care. They don't provide any obstetrical care and they don't help women with adoption services. So the mm -hmm. only way you can make money off of a pregnant woman is to sell an abortion. And so it's not surprising that 92% of pregnant women who enter Planned Parenthood will have an abortion because they are being sold a product. So that was the first thing. And that was concerning for me because I really believe that at Planned Parenthood, we were there to help women, that we were there to reduce the number of abortions. That's what Planned Parenthood said, and I had believed it for eight years. So this was concerning for me. It was all about planning. It was sure. all about family planning and making sure that every child is a wanted child. That's right. That's what right. I thought. That's what I believed. And then, uh, but ultimately, I left after witnessing a live ultrasound-guided abortion procedure take place on a 13-week-old baby. Mm. And I saw that baby fighting and struggling for his life in the womb, trying to get away from the abortion instruments. And I knew that I had been lied to by Planned Parenthood. Um, and, and because of that, because I had believed that lie, I had lied to thousands of women who had come through my facility. And so I knew that I had to leave and I had to start speaking out. And that's what I've done. You know, I told my wife uh, many years ago when we were talking about this, um, uh, it, personally, I, we were in college when Roe v. Wade came out. And, and so 
When I looked at it, I, I was like you. I, I believed a lot of the rhetoric. I, I was somebody who always came to things from a libertarian perspective. So I thought, mm -hmm. I want government out of the out of the bedroom, out of the boardroom. I don't want them telling me how to use, how to run my life. Mm -hmm. And I still feel that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people think because uh, of my position on gay marriage that I don't feel that way. No, I, I don't care what people do. I don't want to have any coercion, and that's what I'm concerned about with that. But with, with this, I thought, well, there, there's some question in my mind, and there's question in other people's minds as to when life begins. And so I was open to that until I ran for Congress, and, and I got involved in some debate forums and candidate questions, and people asked me about partial birth abortion, which was happening at the mm -hmm. time. And I didn't know what they were talking about. And when I went back and looked at the procedure, I said, this is nothing but murder. Mm -hmm. I've been lied to, just as, as you mm -hmm. were. And I told my wife at the time, it's interesting you mentioned that it was ultrasound, because I told my wife at the time, I said, the way we're going to stop this, because there's so much deception and lying going on with this, I said, the, the best thing that anybody could do, I know counseling is important, but I think the organizations need to start trying to fund a way that we can get better imaging of the baby mm -hmm. in the womb. Mm -hmm. And now we have that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't funded by the, the pro-life people, but we do have that. We have 4D ultrasound, and people can see movies of their children in the, in the womb. Yeah. Uh, we, we see uh, National Geographic had a special where they showed dolphins and dogs and elephants in the womb. And, and you could see the detail down to the, to the hair on, mm -hmm. these, on these animals and everything. And we can see that detail uh, w now with 4G ultrasound. But this, the things that we're seeing now, the testimony of people like you who have worked there, the things that we're seeing now with these videos that are coming out now on a weekly basis where they're talking about the things that you have said for a long time, uh, whistleblowers have said, but to see the people who are the doctors, who are the head of the clinics, talking about how they're doing this for profit, negotiating the money there. Mm -hmm. It's just just amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, and I've said before that uh, organ harvesting is a big business. Uh, tissue harvesting is a big business. It's not just, it's not just talking about fetal tissue mm -hmm. here either. I mean, we're talking about, uh, you know, companies like Unos who have millions of dollars of assets, um, you know, People are profiting, organizations are profiting, profiting off of the sale and harvesting of adult yes. organ donors as yeah. well. So, you know, we're not just talking about babies, even though in these videos we are. But, I mean, this is a, this is a, a symptom of a larger problem, and that is the exploitation of life, yes. period. And the modification of life, because we talked yes. in this program earlier about the many articles that have come out, and, of course, they're talking about the good things that can be done with it. They're not talking about the evil things that can be done with it. Right. They're not talking about what the Department of Defense is planning on doing with this. They're not talking about the possibility that they could make mistakes, technological mm -hmm. mistakes that could go horribly wrong with people. Uh, they're not talking about people getting a hold of some of this genetic information and using it to target a particular population, which is what we know that Planned Parenthood uh, anybody who knows their history knows that that's what they were doing. It had a very, very much a eugenicist uh, target behind it. So when we look at this and we look at the fact that they're harvesting this on the front end in this unethical way, it raises concern for me about how this genetic research is going to be used on the back end mm -hmm. as well. Because it's this fetal tissue, uh, human adult tissue that they're grabbing. Uh, and the same people who would resort to getting... Uh, baby body parts for their research are the people who are going to be producing these new genetic miracle drugs, we're told. Right. And one of the things that's, uh, that is terrifying to me is that the, the abortion industry, it's not just the abortion industry. It is mm -hmm. the abortion industry, but it's also, uh, you know, I read somewhere that Texas Tech received a $3 million federal grant to do embryonic uh, stem cell research, you know, harvesting fetal tissue and organs, uh, you know, NIH. I mean, all of these different groups are, are collecting this tissue and doing, we don't know what with it. But the scary thing is that, uh, and, and really the manipulative, and I think one of the worst parts is that, you know, when we would talk to these women who were having an abortion, uh, we would, you know, basically manipulate them into believing that by donating this tissue, they could be saving the lives of others. Yes. But in reality, 
We had no idea what that tissue was going to be used for. That was never disclosed to us at the clinic. It was just for a price. Mm -hmm. So we're going to pay you $200 per specimen per baby. And, uh, and, and you're going to get as many as you can. And then we're going to basically lie to our clients and say, oh, no, we're, we're, you know, this could save the lives of other people when really we have no idea what it's being used for. Um, and Let's talk about that aspect of it, too, because we talked about how, you know, you don't want to you don't want to put a quota on there for a cardiologist or for uh, ontologist or whatever. And we've seen a recent example of a, a doctor who diagnosed people uh, that that didn't have cancer, diagnosed mm -hmm. them with cancer so he could uh, make money off of them. This is something from an organization called uh, Bitch Magazine. That's their name, mm -hmm. <laughs> Bitch Magazine. Mm -hmm. And they say uh, uh, women should have the option to donate but not to sell. Why would you not want women to sell it? Okay, well, the obvious question is you don't want to create an incentive of killing for profit, but that's precisely what they were doing. Well, that's what abortion is, period. Exactly, exactly. Now, Abby will be joining me in studio later this week for an in-depth interview, and we are going to do our part to keep this story in the headlines. Now, coming up, part two of my interview with Jim Mars. He will be discussing a potential Project Blue Beam. And first, we're going to be talking about Google. What could they possibly want with your DNA and your genealogical information? And why is Ancestry.com selling it to them? The medical research company Calico has cut a deal with the largest family tree website on the Internet to get access to your genetic information. Now, you'll recall that Google bought Calico in 2013 as part of their research into prolonging human life. You know, obviously not for the rest of us because they already think the world is too overpopulated, so why do they want us to live forever? We don't even know. Now, with this new DNA data, it's uh, they say it's properly anonymized, okay? So they're not gonna know who you are. But Calico is gonna be looking for genetic patterns in people who have lived exceptionally long lives. And then they're gonna make drugs to help more of us do that. Mm -hmm. Now, they also go on to say how 23andMe, which is Ancestry.com's competitor, and which is run by the ex-wife of Google co-founder Sergey Brin. Uh, they also inked a similar deal with Genentech to parse the genomes of Parkinson's disease patients. So here we got 23andMe and Ancestry.com are these two sites that people will send in their DNA uh, and upload their family tree and stuff like that because everyone wants to learn about their their ancestry and you know see what type of uh, genetic abnormalities they might have if they're going to be prone to any diseases. And now these companies are taking that information and sharing them, profiting off of them, and you'll see how. Now, Tim Sullivan, who's Ancestry's CEO, said that this business has been looking, his private business has been looking for years for ways to use all of that data that people are uploading. Um, they, Ancestry DNA has already genotyped the DNA sequence of one million customers. And two weeks ago, the company launched Ancestry Health, which is a portal for its customers to track their personal health and wellness and then marry that with their genetic data. So they're selling this as this way for people to really, you know, understand themselves, keep track of their health and all of that. But can you see how this is a treasure trove of data? And that's exactly what Calico wants. They want the extensive, detailed genealogical data. Ancestry.com claims to have more than 2 million paying subscribers who have created 7 million historical family trees. So that's just a really rich well for them to dig into for tracking longevity trends. Now, last week we, we reported how Bloomberg uh, was talking about real life superheroes who have genetic mutations. Um, and these genetic mutations are being exploited by drug companies because their DNA could be worth billions of dollars. Bingo, and that's what it is. And this is the same DNA that we're constantly talking about that they would like to patent. They want to patent people's DNA once they discover these mutations. So they talk about one person is Stephen Pete. Uh, he can put his hand on a hot stove or on, on broken glass, and he doesn't feel a thing. 
Timothy Dreyer is a man who has bones so dense he could walk away from an accident that would leave other people with broken limbs. So there's very few people on the planet who share these genetic mutations, um, but these apparent superpowers come from these exceedingly uncommon deviations in their DNA. And these genetic outliers are coveted by drug companies like Amgen and Genentech, and others who are searching for drugs for some of the industry's biggest and most lucrative markets. So both of these men have an enormous amount of suffering, but because they're so rare, the drug companies aren't doing anything to actually help these men. They're just exploiting their mutations so that they can go off and sell them and make a lot of money. But we've also reported how a, an army-sponsored workshop came out with a report on the future of war. And they were foreseeing basically mashed up visions of these swarm bots, cyborgs, and technology running wild. But there will be a few humans as well on the battlefield with these robots, kind of like they're human masters. Um, but these humans would be physically and mentally augmented with enhanced capabilities. Uh, these are gonna improve their ability to sense their environment, make make sense of their environment, and to interact with one another. Now, the report goes on to say, oh, you know, if you ask officials at DARPA, they're gonna tell you that soldier enhancement involving surgery or genetic manipulation is not an area of active interest. But Wired reported in 2007 on some of the augmentation that DARPA was already working on. And so you can see how all this genetic mutation, all of these seeming superpowers that these men have, you know, these really strong bones or they can't feel pain. You could see how the genetic information that's in Ancestry.com and 23andMe would be very vital to companies like DARPA. Wired reported um, DARPA was working on augmenting their soldiers so that they would have more energy. They would need less sleep. They'd have smarter analysis stronger exoskeletons, uh, augmented conditions, you know, like being able to see better, hear better, things like that, better digestion. So <laughs> this would enable them to eat something that was otherwise inedible, you know, basically turning them into human billy goats and also, of course, tougher bodies. So now in 2013, David Knight interviewed uh, AI expert Roman Yampolsky, and he discussed this pending rise of the machines. AI is defined as uh, making computers able to do things uh, people typically better at. So something as trivial as a spell checker on your computer at some point was a very ambitious uh, research project in AI. Now you no longer think of it as uh, being artificial intelligence, but things like that are everywhere. Mm -hmm. We are surrounded by uh, useful applications of AI, mail sorting facilities, for example. Now, also, you would say it would be involved in control systems, right? Like uh, automobiles, for example. Automobiles, but also electric grid, nuclear power plants, uh, satellite navigation, even stock market. Everything is uh, controlled or largely controlled by AIs now. Now, you're a, a veteran of the Singularity University. Could you tell us the difference between Singularity and AI, artificial intelligence? Well, singularity is a concept. Uh, it's an idea that at some point in the future, machines will get to a point where they are as intelligent as people and maybe smarter. And at that point, the progress in technology is accelerating so fast, you can't really predict what's going to happen. It's just becoming too, too exponentially quick for, for human mind to keep up with. There is a lot of discussion about exactly what's going to happen and how quickly and how soon. So I'm trying to be conservative in my predictions. It might take as long as 200 years for us to get to that point. Will it happen? It's very likely. Um, is there an upper limit to intelligence, upper limit to what those systems are capable of? Quite possible, but it's still a lot uh, higher than what human beings are capable of. So for us, it still would be very, very impressive of what those machines can do compared to us. Will it be an instant change, something happening in a matter of minutes or days versus years or decades? Uh, we're not sure about that, but uh, it's equally interesting in both cases. Let's talk about the dangers of artificial intelligence. Uh, 
everybody's pretty much aware because we've talked about it with the Michael Hastings uh, uh, car accident. We've talked about the possibility of cyber attacks. Richard Clark has talked about it. DARPA has talked about it. We've seen videos of people doing that. Those are very simple AI systems, for example. You've got, uh, let's say, an anti-lock braking system. That, that is, at, at one level, that's artificial intelligence. Wouldn't you characterize it that way, where it's making some decisions based on inputs and taking corrective action? Well, sure. You mm -hmm. can uh, explain something as trivial as an if statement in a program as simple case of AI. Uh, sure. We are more interested in general AI, right. human-level AI, but all of those are certainly examples of AI systems. How do we guard against, uh, uh, say, you know, uh, hackers or against uh, bugs, and how do we provide some sort of oversight for that? Well, with hackers, very state-of-the-art algorithms, you can use certain level of encryption, limit uh, network access. There are better practices. None of them guarantee security, but you can certainly increase chances of having a safe system. But the systems like that are inherently likely not to be 100% accurate. At some point, you still have to set a threshold for how many false positives you're willing to tolerate. And if a system is profiling hundreds of millions of citizens, uh, even a tiny percentage, tenth of a percentage point, is still thousands of people who are going to be falsely, falsely identified. If that machine is all powerful and enforcing that set of rules and everyone else, that can create some very unethical consequences. So then what would you, what is your alternative to machine ethics? Well, uh, my suggestion was actually not to place machines in a position of power, certainly not in a position where a machine decides which human gets to live or die. Uh, I'm very skeptical of having machines fully autonomously deciding questions of war, questions of capital punishment. Uh, I don't think there is a 100% safe approach just from ethics uh, point of view. This is part two of my interview with Jim Mars. Now, I wanted to talk to you about a lot of people are, are concerned with this disclosure project and they're wondering what's going on. And I feel like we are kind of being really prepped for something. Now, many, many years ago, Reagan actually actually said how great it would be if there was some sort of an invasion from outer space, because then everyone would get together and, and we would all be one human race. Uh, so we've kind of ha been having little drips of that and how that could tie into a one world government. Uh, but, you know, Stephen Hawking came out 2010, said, don't contact aliens. They're much, much more advanced. Just uh, yesterday on The Independent, the scientist, a scientist warns the world to think twice before replying to alien signals from outer space, because once again, they're probably much more advanced than we are. Uh, you know, last year, Vatican astronomer citing, this is from the Vatican, talking about our extraterrestrial brothers. And uh, he said there could be other beings who remained in full friendship with their creator. So really prepping us for some type of an encounter with uh, extraterrestrial life. And we have the Pope uh, coming out with his papal encyclical talking about a planetary council to oversee the world. Uh, we've got um, a Canadian, former Canadian defense minister saying governments are hiding aliens and he's urging world leaders to reveal the secret files. So, I mean, this was what, Friday, July 24th, this came out, or I'm sorry, April 22nd, April 22nd. So, I mean, we're seeing a lot of this happening. So what do you think? <laughs> well, <laughs> number one, I'm not worried about an Independence Day type invasion where they blow up our cities and they're trying to eat us and and uh, it, it's in uh, people like Hawkins who say, oh, don't contact them. They may be dangerous. I, I can't help but laugh at that because uh, having actually taught a college level course on UFOs and having studied that for many years, going back into the 50s, actually, um, the whole idea of UFOs and extraterrestrials, this is nothing new. This goes back throughout our recorded history. You got Ezekiel with fiery wheel in the Bible, and it picked him up, carried him to a city, you know. Mm -hmm. And you've got the flying boats of the ancient Egyptians, the flying dragons of the Chinese, the Viamas of the Hindus, you right. the flying shields of the Romans. I mean, all the way up today with the crop circles and the animal mutilations, and it, it's always been here. Mm -hmm. So, so why if, are they high? I mean, so if, well, if their purpose then was to eat us or enslave us. You know, they would have done it long before now. And it's like the scientist says, well, maybe we don't want to send signals in space. They may be more advanced than us. 
Well, if they're more advanced than us, you better believe they know we're here, okay? I think they I think they leave us alone because I think that something similar to the Star Trek Prime Directive, you know, that they have in Star Trek, which says that it's uh, is not proper uh, to to uh, overtly interfere with the natural progress of a species. And now whether that's an actual law with enforcement troops and stuff, I, I'm not sure. I think it's probably more of a universal understanding by people and civilizations that have gotten advanced enough to move into space. They're also socially advanced enough to know it's not proper to go and interfere. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you a good example. Um, not long back, they discovered in the South America a Stone Age tribe and uh, so they quickly sealed off that whole area, not to keep them in, but to keep everybody else out so that scientists could go and actually study them and find out how Stone Age people lived. And then they, uh, they went through a conditioning process, uh, a, their own disclosure, if you will. And they had some of the scientists would let themselves be seen from a distant hilltop. And then they moved a little closer and they'd be seen across the field, you know. And until finally they made contact. And when, by the time now these villagers knew that they weren't a threat. And so they accepted their uh, presence. And then they gave them a few rudimentary things like maybe metal knives or something that improved their life. But it was unlike most of man's history where... Uh, in Western civilization, they'd rush in with Bibles and guns and say, put on some clothes, you know. Or and smallpox. Yeah, smallpox <laughs> and totally destroy their civilization. So that's going on. So actually, we're in the same thing on a grander scale. Uh, if you extrapolate on up, I know going back to the 1950s, the national polls showed that virtually no one believed there was any kind of life outside the earth. Mm. Today, it's quite the opposite. The vast majority really believe, especially younger people, aliens, people all over the world, sure, they accept right. that. Well, we got a lot of movies coming out like that as well. Um, now, wh what about Project Bluebeam? I mean, do you think that there is maybe an effort by the elite or kind of the secret hands to possibly use some sort of a disclosure as a means to usher in a one-world government? Well, Let's say, let me say this about disclosure. Uh, disclosure is not going to come from any of our governments, okay? And it, actually, it already has. If you listen to some of our astronauts and if you listen to Paul Hayer, former Defense Ministry of, of Canada, if you'll, it, you know, on and on, Werner Von Braun, they talked about aliens and extraterrestrials. So it's out there for the people who want to look at it. But the real disclosure is going to come only from them. And, and it's simple enough. All they got to do is let themselves be known, hover above a large city long enough for the news crews to get out there with their cameras, and the, and the game's up. Right. Well, and I think, you know, with the uh, crop circles and everything, I mean, is that not enough of a message or people? Absolutely. If you look at it, of course, see, it, 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 this conditioning process is, and particularly if you look at it from the standpoint of a government, say the United States government, they have to represent all the people, okay? Now, there's a segment of the people, you and I would fall into this. We really want to know the truth. We really want to know, are they out there and where they come from and what are they doing? But you got another segment of the population. They really don't want to know. I, I don't want to know that stuff. And so what the government does is play very cozy. For example, the crash at Roswell in 1947, okay? On the one hand, you have a government pronouncement that says, no, 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 it's just a, a mogul balloon. It was, uh, you know, it was some crash dummies. Uh, nothing unusual happened there. Back by little or nothing as far as evidence goes. On the other hand, you've got about 500 people who are now in the public record saying, I was there and I picked up pieces of the wreckage and I saw the bodies and I transported the bodies et cetera, et cetera. But they leave you that choice. Right. You can choose which one you want to believe. And so when they tell you, well, it was just crash dummies, uh, in this way, the people who actually study the evidence can go, holy cow, they're lying to us. That means it's true. So they're, they're told the truth. And the people who don't want to hear about it, they can go to sleep peacefully and say, well, the government yeah. said it was just crash dummies. People love that cognitive dissonance. I know they talk a lot about... Uh, I think they even came out a few months ago and said a lot of the things you thought were unidentified flying objects were actually just military 
uh, equipment we didn't want you guys to know about just yet. So but, that's kind of their new ploy. Right, and and which is a great sounding public relations thing. But see, how do you explain the Aurora crash of 1897 that was seen, recorded in the newspapers in Texas, seen by hundreds of people, and uh, said uh, the newspaper account said the pilot uh, uh, was not an inhabitant of this world. And this occurred six years before the Wright brothers flew. Mm. There was nothing man-made in the air. See, they skip over that. Yeah, and we've actually got some uh, Pentagon documents. Uh, I was just looking at, the, at them the other day where they talk about um, interacting with these people and and. They were human-like, but a little bit taller, and they had lasers on their ships. And then these are Pentagon documents, and when you click on it at the .gov site, there's a big warning that comes up and says, these are old, and it's probably, we don't probably agree with what's here, but in public interest, here are these documents, and they encounter, you know, I mean, it's like, it's right there. It's the old plausible deniability yeah, you again. You, you know, you to. can believe it if you want to, but you don't have to believe it. And of course, the controversy rolls on. So, and that's what's going to happen with this closure. Um, it, it, it's really incredible, but do not look for a government official of any type to step forward and say, okay, okay, here's the truth. Right. Because number one, nobody, a half the population wouldn't believe him anyway. Right. Especially, you know, the Vatican ushering on our extraterrestrial brothers. For me, that's a huge Project Blue Beam red light. Well, Jim Mars, thank you so much. I know you talk about a, a little bit of, of this stuff in, in one of your books, Our Occulted History. Uh, there's a lot of other books. Also, well. also my uh, book, of, even before that, was Alien Agenda, mm. which goes starts with the premise that UFOs are real, so who are they and what do they want? And and that, I've been told, has become the top-selling nonfiction book on UFOs in the world. Wow. Well, congratulations. All right. Jim Mars, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, two years after Americans petitioned the president to pardon Edward Snowden, the White House has responded. And they basically said that he needs to come on home and face a jury of his peers. Now, Lisa Monaco, who is the White House Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor, she said, if he felt his actions were consistent with civil disobedience, then he should do what those who have taken issue with their own government do, challenge it, speak out, engage in a constructive act of protest, and importantly, accept the consequences of his actions. He should come home to the U.S. and be judged by his jury of his peers, not hide behind the cover of an authoritarian regime. Right, come home and be judged by the totalitarian regime. We've seen how they've treated whistleblowers. We've seen how they've treated people peaceably petitioning and protesting their government. Uh, we've seen them being sprayed uh, with all kinds of implements that the police are using these days to rally up protesters. Uh, you know, so it's just t such a joke. She's saying this kind of tongue in cheek, you know, come on home, Edward Snowden, we'll treat you fair. And now she goes on to say, instead of constructively addressing these issues, Mr. Snowden's dangerous decision to steal and disclose classified information had severe consequences for the security of our country and the people who work day in and day out to protect it. Now, first of all, we pointed this out many times, the NSA surveillance program failed to stop a single terror attack. Instead, it violated the constitutional rights of every single American in this country. It caused a lot of issues with our overseas allies because they're spying on them as well. Um, but it hasn't even stopped people from hacking into any of <laughs> the government. I mean, we just recently had the Office of Personnel Management uh, being hacked into and leaving millions of government employees totally vulnerable to attackers, uh, hackers and identity theft. So, you know, just what did Snowden do again? So he revealed just how pervasive the government surveillance of the American people has been. And because of that information, the NSA has now said that it's soon going to stop examining and will ultimately destroy millions of American calling records that it has collected. Now, Congress passed a law in June ending the collection, and instead they're going to allow the NSA to request the records from phone companies as needed in terrorism investigations. Previously, I guess they just had these back doors built right in, 
connected directly. Uh, they were just siphoning off all of this information directly and claiming that they were getting authorized to do that through these secret courts. But it isn't already too late. I mean, have we already built enough of a surveillance state all around us and worldwide? We've reported how local governments are increasingly poking through your garbage. Um, they say that, you know, in order to make pe sure people are just properly recycling. Now they've got garbage trucks with the ability to record the contents of your trash. And this is going to be on video. They're going to be able to inspect each object in your trash. So forget about metadata. The contents of your trash can be supremely and surprisingly revealing. Uh, but also, now we've got some new drunk driving legislation that could require breathalyzers in all new vehicles. And of course, this is coming down from the nanny state New York. Congresswoman Kathleen Rice, she's going to push this legislation mandating U.S. automakers uh, equip all new cars with breath testing units. So, I mean, that's fine. You want to stop drunk driving, but I don't want to have to blow into a breathalyzer every single time that I want to start my car. I mean, it's ridiculous. They believe we're all too stupid to run our own lives. Now, Paul Watson reporting from the UK today revealed that not only are the banks tracking the physical locations of their customers, but they're also sharing that with third parties. This is Paul Joseph Watson reporting live for Infowars.com outside the Bank of England. Now we had a story up on Infowars.com today about Halifax Bank working in tandem with a third party. What's happening is the customers who visit their bank, not even to speak to bank staff but merely to withdraw money from ATMs, are having their physical location, the date and time from when they visited that bank tracked, put in a database and sold to this third party. Now we contacted Halifax Bank and the third party, they didn't deny it, they basically acknowledged that they had this policy in place whereby they were tracking the location of their customers as they visited the bank in real time, putting that information in a database, selling it to third parties who then call up customers and say, we know you were at the bank last Friday, we want to talk to you about your visit. Of course they do it under the guise of helping people. But the individual that contacted us was shocked at the fact that his private tracking location and his, his movements around the city were being sold to this third party and then used to put in a database and then basically harass him via phone calls. So we have the likes of HSBC, you know, getting slapped on the wrist, getting these fines for drug and money laundering, whereas for the private bank customer, the ordinary individual, their movements are under suspicion. You tie this in with the fact that now withdrawing any amount of cash in significant quantities as low as £5,000 is being treated as a suspicious activity by HSBC Bank and others while they're getting away with these monumental crimes and this fraud on a grand scale. Again, go straight to the point that we're under a microscope while they're getting away with committing fraud and these giant crimes. So people are really concerned about this. It's an evolving story. Uh, we're going to keep track of it. We're going to give you more updates. This is Paul Joseph Watson reporting live from the Bank of England for Infowars.com. So any program that involves the government's systematic monitoring of citizens crosses the line. Without privacy, there is no freedom. Now, NSA whistleblower William Benny talks about the NSA and how their encroachment is the minority report. One of the, that's really one of the main driving factors for the White House Big Data Initiative that they issued in early 2012. The whole idea there was to have uh, uh, industry come up with algorithms that could uh, uh, go through massive amounts of data, which they're collecting on everybody in the country and the planet, and figure out uh, things that are important for them to do and uh, to our actions they should take. Basically, it's minority report on a super massive scale. That's how to figure out what people are intending to do or what they're all about uh, from the data that you've acquired on them in every domain. Uh, and it's all done automatically with software then presented to people to make decisions and take action. That's, that's part of what I think you're getting at, Alex, and also, I guess, uh, what the caller is getting at. And it, that is quite, I mean, that's basically artificial intelligence being used and applied uh, on, under a rule-based system that's being developed by analysts in many, many departments of government, none of whom are using things in a necessarily a disciplined or professional way. So they're going to make a lot of mistakes. Well, it's like you said six months ago <laughs> in the London Guardian, 
uh, when you testify before the parliament uh, or, or the EU parliament, the NSA is about total population control. Close quote, this is social engineering uh, so they can manipulate markets, know what we're going to buy before we buy it. Uh, I mean, a microcosm is the old customer loyalty cards that it's been proven in court are to decide what you'll pay more for so they can rip you off, not so you get a loyalty card. You just think you're 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 getting something for nothing, but really you're being gamed, and now they want to just feed all data federally through this system and get industry to do it, I guess kind of legalizing it. Yeah, well, that's uh, <clears throat> that's basically the whole idea behind all this big data, White House big data initiative, too. That's the same it's the same issue. It's getting back to the being able to do uh, what what the the movie, the Minority Report, depicted mentally. People were reading their minds and projecting into the future. Well, they're 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 doing that and wanting to do that with data collected on everybody in the in all domains of the activity of people, uh, including their health, finance, and everything else, and and then do uh, that kind of projection uh, uh, with that with software running against that data. Mr. Benny, if we don't turn this around, the way this is being used, this commitment to authoritarianism we're seeing, where do you see it ending, sir, if things don't go well? Well, I see us uh, basically, uh, uh, I see it ending up in, the, in, in basically destroying uh, the essence of humanity. I mean, that fundamentally, we won't be able to uh, be human anymore. That's the way I look at it. I agree, I mean, because... Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why, I mean, that's why, you know, we fought a revolution, right? Well, the essence of humanity is free association, is privacy. Exactly. So many historians and philosophers have pointed out, if you don't have privacy, you don't have uh, humanity. That's right. That's the way I look at it, too.